Um, this morning, we are going to be talking about uh, Jesus when he says, I am the light of the world. So um, if you haven't been here in the past couple weeks, our church is going through the seven I am statements of Jesus in the book of John. Today we will be on I am the light of the world in John chapter 8, uh, verse 12. But before we do that, um, I'm going to go to John chapter 1. So if you would turn there in your Bibles, I think you're going to be blessed if you... You really do turn there in a physical Bible if you have one. There might be one under the seat. If you don't have one, that's okay. It will be on the screen. It will be on your phone. But especially when we get into John chapter 8, you're going to want to see the context. You're going to want to see like, oh, when was that? What, what did he say there? You kind of want to look back and forth. And I think it'll help you out. But if you don't have it, that's okay. We will have the words on screen. Um, and I won't say something's scripture unless it's not. I'm going to be reading from the uh, NIV this morning. Um, and uh, yeah, this is going to be an interesting sermon. Um, you guys probably know the Ten Commandments. Right? You've heard it. Uh, Sometimes in the American church, we have two extra ones. Commandment number 11, be nice. Commandment number 12, uh, don't make anybody uncomfortable. Jesus is going to break both of those two epigraphal commandments this morning. And so, uh, as a result, I will have to as well. Um, So I'm going to be reading out of the NIV, but whatever version you have, whether it's ESV, NASB, uh, NLT, it should work out so long as you don't have the NWT. You guys know that one? The New World translation. It's the Jehovah's Witness translation of the Bible. They have somewhat notoriously uh, mistranslated John chapter 1 and John chapter 8 for their own ends to uh, change the theology of the Bible, right? Because they want to tell you that Jesus is not God. The God of Jehovah's Witness was not willing to die for you, but he was a sadist who created someone else to kill in your place, right? It's important to remember that Jehovah's Witness is not Christian, but they claim that their God is Jehovah, which is also a name we use for God, right? We say Jehovah Jireh, but it's not. It's separate and it's different, and we need to be honest about that and ready for that. And by all means, when Jehovah's Witness come to your door, speak to them with all gentleness and love, right? Invite them into your home, share the gospel with them, show them your own faults in your life, confess your sin, but, right, don't be dishonest. You need to be clear. Jesus is God, and they are telling lies, They're blaspheming the name of Jehovah. They're blaspheming the name of Yahweh, our God. And Jesus says, right, if anyone leads one of these children astray, it would be better for a millstone to be tied around their neck and for them to be thrown into the raging sea. So when you see the Jehovah's Witness leading people astray, it should upset you, right? It should upset you. There is a time and a place where you need to be as gentle and loving as Jesus was when he said to the Pharisees, you whitewashed tombs. Pretty on the outside and dead on the inside. You're full of lies. Jesus is God, right? We're going to talk about why that's so important today. That's why we're starting in John chapter 1. Jesus is God, and he's offering you eternal life, but not if you believe him in your own way. You need to believe who he says he is. So we're going to, we're going to see why some of that uh, is going to come into play today and uh, why I'm going so hard on the Jehovah's Witness before we even pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time to preach your word. Um, There's a lot here to talk about this morning. Uh, Give me wisdom what to say and what not to say. May your name be glorified and may my name not be glorified. Allow your word to um, come at me just as much as it comes at the rest of us, Lord. It will at times make us low, Lord, but you intend to glorify your name and we want to see it glorified this morning. So please prepare us to read your word. It's in your name we pray, amen. I have so many notes on John chapter 1. I was so excited to talk about John chapter 1 to introduce the sermon, but we just don't have time. So we're going to read it pretty quickly. Uh, And if there's ever another chance, I'm I'm going to do a sermon on John chapter 1 because I just love it. So we're going to read it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So right here at the beginning, we have someone called the Word. And he is simultaneously with God and God. Keep going. He was with God in the beginning. When? As far back as you can go, the beginning. (coughs) Through him, through the word, this one who was simultaneously with God and was God, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. So this word is the creator. This one who is with God and who is God is the creator. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind, right? So we see light and life tied together. What is John doing here? John, um, bless him, he's incredibly Jewish-minded. His Greek's not so good, if you ever studied the Greek New Testament. Um, 
he's thinking of the Semitic idea of light. He's thinking about what light is in the Psalms, what light is in the Old Testament. And light represents God's salvation and freedom to those who are in darkness. And it, rec- it, it, it recognizes seeing instead of being blind, right? And so the word, right, who is with God and is God, right, is also the source of salvation and freedom. Verse 5, the light shines in the darkness. So the light is coming into the darkness, right? And the darkness has not overcome it. Praise God, but also notice it's going to try to overcome it. And that's also important. Another reason I wanted to look at this passage is I want you to see this conflict is a guarantee. You can't have light and darkness hanging out in the same room together. It doesn't work, right? The light and dark can't just be like, I'll sit in this corner and that corner, right? It diffuses. As bright as the light is, the darkness will not be. There was a man sent from God. His name was John. This is John the Baptist. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Right? So John the Baptist came to give testimony about the light. John the Baptist is not the light. Who did John come to give testimony about? You read it a few verses later in John chapter 1. We're not going to read that far this morning, but he's here to testify about Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. So to be clear, Jesus is the Word. He's the one who's with God. He's the one who is God. He's the one who created all things, and he's the one in whom there is life and light. There is salvation and freedom in Jesus. There is seeing instead of blindness. There is light instead of darkness. Verse 11, he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. There's conflict. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or husband's will, but born of God. And I want to keep going, but we're going to move over to John chapter 8. So I'll give you a second turn there in your Bible. We're going to go to John chapter 8, verse 12. All righty. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So here's Jesus again. Now he's declaring himself to be the light. He's declaring himself to be salvation. He's declaring himself to be the truth, wisdom, not blind. You'll be able to see, right, in me, And if you follow him, you won't walk in darkness. You'll be able to see. You'll be free. You'll be saved. But where is Jesus and why is he saying this? Right? We started with when Jesus spoke again to the people. Where is he anyway? Right? So Jesus is in Jerusalem at the Feast of the Tabernacles. Right? This is actually the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And what's the Feast of Tabernacles? It's this big Jewish feast. Lots of people come to Jerusalem. Right, to celebrate. Uh, several things it celebrates. One is it celebrates the time that the Jews were living in tents going around the wilderness after God set them free from Egypt. And it thanks God for providing them and taking care of them. Also at the Feast of Tabernacles, they celebrate the vine and tree fruit harvest. Right? It's late fall. They celebrate God's provision for grapes and all of these different tree fruits that are in the land of Israel. And also, right, uh, it's coming to be winter. So a few things are about to happen. It's going to be a dry season and the days are about to get shorter. So there's a water ceremony where they cleanse things and they celebrate God's provision of water throughout the year and for the harvest, right? And if you go back to John chapter 7 at the beginning of the Feast of Tabernacles, which we're not going to do today, but Jesus gives a contextually appropriate sermon on him being the water of life, right? Uh, I'm not going to go into that side of the Feast of Tabernacles because we're going to talk about the other big ceremony. Days were about to get shorter and they didn't have electric lights, right? Uh, Being in darkness was actually a hardship on people, right? And so when you came to the Feast of Tabernacles, there's a huge lighting ceremony where you celebrated God's provision of light throughout the year. And you would also uh, pray for God's continued provision of light. And so here's one of the main things. On the last night of the Feast of Tabernacles, there'd be this big lighting ceremony. And in the women's court of the temple, there are these four massive pillars built up. And on each of the four pillars, there's four bowls, right? And they put all kinds of fuel into all 16 of these bowls and they would light them, right? And it was just tremendously bright. People writing about it, Jews and not Jews, said you could not tell the difference between day and night in Jerusalem. People would carry torches. They would light everything. 
And there were, there were rabbis who said, if you have not seen the lighting ceremony at the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem, you have never seen anything amazing, right? You can imagine how tremendously bright it is as the light is reverberating off of the yellow limestone of Jerusalem, right? It's tremendous. You've never seen anything like it. And here's Jesus on that day, the lighting ceremony, saying he's not the light of Jerusalem. Right. I'm the light of the world. I'm here to bring light to the entire world. And we're going to be talking about that the whole time. But let's see a little bit more context. What happens when Jesus says this? The Pharisees, the Pharisees challenged him. Verse 13. Here you are appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. This is uh, one of the Pharisees' favorite lines. They say it a lot throughout the book of John. Anytime Jesus says something, they're like, your testimony is not valid. You're speaking for yourself. Right? Jesus has also answered it lots of times. This is probably his shortest answer. Um, but still lengthy, right? Jesus answered, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid, for I know where I came from and where I am going, right? And we know because we've read John chapter one, the Pharisees don't quite get it yet, they'll get it. But Jesus is God, right? Jesus has come from the side of the Father. He knows who he is. He knows what his identity is. And so what he says on his own is true. He says, but you have no idea where I come from or where I am going. You judge by human standards. The word in the Greek is flesh. You judge by the flesh. The NIV here is a little awkward. It says, I pass judgment on no one, which is not true. He passes judgment in this passage and in the next passage on lots of people. What I believe it should be is I pass judgment on no one by the flesh. I don't do it by worldly, earthly standards the way that you do it. I do it by the Spirit. But if I do judge, verse 16, my decisions are true because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. Right? He's saying, my Father sent me. Jesus' word, uh, not because of the law of man that the Pharisees are looking to, but because of its origin and his identity. Verse 17, in your own law it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. I'm the one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. Right? So Jesus is saying, even by your own standards, I have multiple witnesses. And in previous passages, he's added to the list. He says, the prophets testify to me. In fact, the whole Old Testament testifies to me. They're my witnesses. My miracles testify to me. Those are my witnesses. But the Pharisees don't understand what he's saying yet. They will. Don't worry. <laughs> then they asked him, where's your father? Right? If he's supposed to be testifying with you, where is he? Jesus says, you don't know me or my father, which is a strong statement. They can't be as offended by it yet, but they will be. If you knew me, you would know my Father also. And so Jesus is pointing out the root problem with the Pharisees. They don't know God. They don't know him, right? It's true what Isaiah said. They will praise me with their lips, but in their hearts they won't know me or love me. Jesus spoke these words while teaching in the temple courts near the place where the offerings were put. Yet no one seized him. Does anybody know where the offerings were put in the temple? In the women's court, right by those four pillars with those four big bowls, right in the middle of the lighting ceremony. There's Jesus standing. I can almost imagine it is as they're being lit, right? That's where Jesus is choosing to stand, right? Very contextually appropriate sermon. And he comes and he says, I'm not the light of Jerusalem. I am the light of the world, ruining the mood for all the people who've traveled from all over to Jerusalem for this big ceremony and making it all about him. And so obviously the people are angry. And so it says no one seized him. Why? Because his hour had not yet come, right? Because it's not a matter of the, the Jews or the Pharisees' opinion as to when Jesus should die. It's his own. Jesus says a few chapters later, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord, of my own will, I lay it down for them. And so Jesus is saying, I am the light, right? Salvation, I am truth, I am wisdom, I am freedom. And he's going to touch on all of these topics more as we go forward. But he's saying, I am that, not just for the Jews, right? I'm not just going to light up Jerusalem, and not just for one night. I am the light of the whole world, and he who walks in me will never walk in darkness. So once more, Jesus said to them, I am going away. And you will look for me, and you will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. Mm. 
So once more Jesus said to them, why does it say once more? Because he's also said it before. You can go read it in chapter 7 if you want. Um, I'm going away, and you will look for me, and you will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. They are going to look for the light of the world. They're going to look for truth. They're going to look for salvation. They're going to look for freedom. And Jesus is saying, you're going to die in your sin. You are not going to find it. Well, Jesus actually says this several times also throughout the book of John. Where I go, you cannot come. And every time the Jews mock Jesus after he says it, it was something that is almost ironically true. Right? This time, well, a previous time, right? he says, what? Is he going to preach to the Gentiles? Yes, he is. <laughs> uh, he does go and he preaches to the Gentiles. And also, um, through him, right, he continues to work through his people to reach the entire world. Because he is the light of the world. And we're going to see that part of that responsibility falls on you, but I won't go there yet. This time, did you say, will he kill himself? Is that why he says, where I go, you cannot come? Right? Is he going to die? Now, Jesus doesn't commit suicide, but he does lay down his life. Right? That is what's going to happen. And Jesus continues, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. Jesus says, you think of earthly things. <laughs> Remember, you judge by the flesh, he said earlier. Not so for me. I'm not of this world. I judge by the spirit. I am from above. I told you that you would die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am he, you will indeed die in your sins, right? So here we have a conditional. We have an if, right? Maybe it's not 100% guaranteed they will die in their sins. But if you don't believe that I am he, what does that mean? Well, the NIV uh, messed up a little bit again here. And awkwardly, the NIV's own commentary agrees that they messed up here. So I don't know why it's like this in the NIV, but it is, <laughs> right? Uh, in the Greek, the word he isn't there, Right? That's not what Jesus says. He says, if you do not believe that I am, you will indeed die in your sins. Now, Jesus is making this point throughout John chapter 8, and at the end, he's going to make it so abundantly clear. There's not a commentary, there's not a translation except for the New World Translation that disagrees that Jesus is claiming to be I am, right, when we get to the end. But he's making that point throughout. The Jews don't get it at first, but he is already beginning to make that point. For those of you who don't know, what, what, what's the significance of I am? Jesus is pointing back to Exodus chapter 3. Mm -hmm. Moses says, when the Jews ask, who do I say sent me? What's your name, God, as God speaks to him from the burning, burning bush? And God says, Eheyer asher, yeah, Eheyer asher eheyer, which means I am who I am. I'm the God who is there. Yeah. I'm the God who is, as opposed to everything else. My existence is not dependent on anything else. Wow. Everything else, its existence is dependent on me. I am the God who is there. I am the creator God. I am the origin. I am the originator. He says, tell them I am sent you. You shall call me. He is. You shall call me Yahweh. That's what Yahweh means. He's the God who is, right? Then he says, you shall call me Yahweh through all generations, the God who is, right? But Jesus does not even use Yahweh. He doesn't make it grammatically what they might think correct, right? Rather, he claims, I am. If you do not believe that I am, the Jews don't get it yet, they won't get as angry as they will in a minute, you will indeed die in your sins. He's saying, if you don't believe that I am the creator God, if you don't believe I am the God who is there, you will indeed die in your sins. Why, Why is it so important to believe that Jesus is God? Why is it that the Jehovah's Witness or the Mormons who claim Jesus is not God are not true Christians? Why? Is it important? Someone still died for your sins. If Jesus is not God, there is no forgiveness of sins. Imagine, you've probably heard an example like this before. Imagine I steal 100 bucks from Randy, right? I just take $100 out of his wallet, okay? I'm $100 richer. I've sinned against Randy and against God, but we'll just talk about Randy for a minute for the illustration. Randy's got some options. He can seek legal help. He can fight me. He can attack me. He can make me pay him back in some way, probably plus interest for the crime, right? He can make me pay him back, or he can forgive the debt. What happens if he forgives the debt? Randy is out $100. He has to bear the weight of the debt. That's the way debts and forgiveness work. If I forgive somebody who hurts me, I'm not hurting them back anymore. I'm taking the hurt. 
I'm taking the loss, I'm taking the damage, and it's mine now. And I forgive you, and I don't put it back on you. I don't pay you back, I don't make you repay me in any way. That's fundamentally what forgiveness is. And so it's absolutely necessary, if God is going to forgive our sins, that he's the one who bears the debt. If Jesus is not God, there is no forgiveness of sins. It's merely that God took revenge on the wrong person. There is no forgiveness of sins. It's merely God took revenge on the wrong person. It is essential that Jesus is God. We cannot pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, right? The Unitarian, the, the, the belief that Jesus is not God, right? That type of forgiveness is, is, is like this. My boss is abusive to me at work, and I forgive him by not paying him back, by go, but by going home and abusing my children, right? But that's not what it is. Jesus is the light of the world, and the, the light of the world in the Old Testament is God, right? And Jesus is declaring here, I am God, and you need to believe that I am God, and I have come to pay for your sins, right? God just can't introduce, right? Sin is between me and God. It has nothing to do with a third party, mm-hmm. Right? If God just punishes some third party, that third party should take revenge on God. God's not just, but he is just. So uh, the NIV is a little off here on verse 25 as well. It says, you do not believe that I am, right? And so the natural response that they have is, you are what? (laughs) They want an answer to that question. They, they, they They don't want to go there, right? They're like, you are what? They asked. And Jesus says, just what I've been telling you from the beginning. He's the light of the world. He's the source of salvation. He's truth. He is freedom. They don't believe because they're from below, and he is from above. Jesus says, I have much to say in judgment of you, but he who sent me is trustworthy, and what I heard from him, I tell the world. We know who he's talking about. They don't get it yet. They did not understand that he was telling them about his father. So Jesus said, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. And again, that word he is not in the Greek. I'm not going to go into as much detail again because we just talked about it. But then he says, then you will know that I am, and I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. So lifted up is another phrase that Jesus repeats throughout the Gospel of John. It usually refers to his crucifixion. A lot of times it goes beyond that. It's crucifixion, burial, resurrection, and ascension. It's when he is glorified. Right? And so Jesus says, when I'm glorified, it's going to be clear who I am and that I do nothing of my own accord. Verse 29, the one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. And even as Jesus spoke, many believed in him. Oh, that sounds encouraging, right? And I thought about stopping the passage there and preaching the rest of the sermon from there. Uh, but it doesn't end there. So we've got to keep going a little bit. I know it's a long passage, but bear with me. Even as he spoke, many believed in him. So they're believing Jesus. Sounds good. Jesus doesn't quite seem to buy it. So to the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus says, If you hold to my teaching, then you really are my disciples. That word if is really tricky in English and in Greek. What does if mean? It can mean several things in English and several things in Greek. Everything I'm about to say applies equally to English and Greek, in case you're you're like, oh, well, he's just saying a promise. It applies actually a little better in Greek in some of these instances. If can have several different relationships, right? My wife isn't here this morning. She's taking care of one of our kids who's sick, right? But I'm still going to use her as an example, right? If you're talking about Ashley, then you're talking about my wife, That is an equative sense of if, right? Two things are equal. My wife is Ashley, okay? Another example of if, cause and effect, right? If I marry her, then she will put a ring on her finger, right? Okay? If, then, cause and effect. If I do this, then this. But the one that I believe is using here is not either of those. It's called evidence inference, right? If she has a ring on her finger, evidence, then she's married, inference, right? So what Jesus is saying, if you hold to my teaching, right, if that evidence is there, if there is fruit in your life that I see you holding to my teaching, inferences, then you really are my disciples. 
but we will see if they really hold to his teaching, right? He's saying, if there is fruit, then you really are my disciples. And if you're really my disciples, verse 32, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. <coughs> saying, you will know the truth if you come to me. Remember, he's the light. He's the revealer. Um, Jesus so far has said, you don't know the Father. I don't know that the Jews get who the Father is, yet they will. He says, you will die in your sins. sins. He says it again, you will indeed die in your sins if you don't believe that I am. He's also saying here that right now you don't know the truth if you don't know me. And he's also saying, you are slaves. You need to be set free. Jesus is saying some hard things, but he wants you to be set free. We're going to look more at this passage in a minute, or at least I'm going to quote it several times. But in 1 John chapter 1, it says, If you walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with each other, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sins. Right. Right? <coughs> you can be cleansed, you can be free. Right? Let's see if the Jews understand it. They don't. Sorry. Verse 33, they answered him, We are Abraham's descendants, and have never been slaves of anyone except the Egyptians, Assyrians, Babylonians, Greeks, and Romans, uh, how can you say that we shall be set free? So are these Jews historically ignorant? Do they not know? Now, this was a very common Jewish mentality at the time. We are children of Abraham, so we are not slaves. You're only a slave if you choose to be a slave. We're special. We're the children of Abraham. We're free. We do what we want. In fact, if you read uh, Mark 9 through 13, right, Jesus repeatedly pronounces God is going to send judgment on Jerusalem. And in 70 AD, he does, right? The Romans come in, they destroy the temple, they destroy Jerusalem. And the very last stronghold, the Mossad, right? You can find writings of Jewish people in this stronghold, and it's awful the way they all die there. I don't even want to talk about it this morning because it's not that relevant. But you'll find writings of them saying, we are children of Abraham. We are not slaves to anyone, right? We're free. You're only a slave if you choose to be. We're special because of this lineage, but Jesus is not having it. He says, he replies, verse 34, Very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. All right? Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. You're a slave to something, right? Ray's talked about that a lot in Romans. So I'm not going to go into that in detail. All right? But the truth will set you free. All right? There's an aspect of walking in the light as he is in the light. All right? So we've been cleansed of all our sin, right? That means we do need to walk in the truth. Jesus is the truth. The truth is a person, but we also need to come clean about our sins. Right. Right. That same passage, right, in 1 John, right, says, if you say you have no sin, right, the truth is not in you, right, you're a liar. That's right. hmm. It says, but if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us all yes. unrighteousness. He's faithful. He will do it. Yes. He really will. If you confess your sins to him, if you walk into the light, right? It's uncomfortable to walk into the light. Your sin is going to be exposed. It's uncomfortable to confess your sin. But he says, if you do, you'll be confessed. You'll be set free from your sins. If you walk in the truth, the truth will set you free. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us our sins. He's just because he pays the price for the sins. He doesn't abandon justice. He bears it. He doesn't just ignore it. Right. He deals with the pain of sin. He is faithful and just to forgive. And this is such an amazing promise that you could be set free from your sins. Have you had sins in your life that you're like, there is no way I could ever be set free from that? Yeah. There's sin that controls your life. I've had so many. Just real honestly, I was trying to decide which one to talk about. So I picked one, right? I was a liar. Like, just such a bad liar. I, mean, I was a really good liar, good at lying. Yeah. But I would do it all the time, right, to make myself seem better, mm -hmm. to make myself seem more worshipable, to be an idol, to control people, to manipulate people. I would lie. And I remember this one lie I told as a teenager. There was no remorse. There was no even thought of this is wrong. There was no uncomfortableness at all, right? I was not free from that sin. I was not free from the sin of lying. I was controlled by it. There was no even doubt in my mind. Lying and controlling my identity was my master. And that friend, when I, who I lied to as a teenager, I happened to run into him 10 years later. Right? 
And he asked me, right? It happened to come up. He said, hey, was that thing you told me 10 years ago true? And you know what I said this time? I actually said, yes, it's true. I lied again. <laughs> what? But something had happened in 10 years of sanctification. I could not hold on to that lie anymore. And I immediately felt so guilty. I couldn't hold on to that lie. God was saying, no, you walk in the light. You're honest about your sins and your brokenness. And I cleanse you of your sins. I'm your identity now. You're, you're my child. You're a child of the light, right? You're set free from that sin. And so that sin in my heart began to burn like the fire of hell. And it was so uncomfortable trying to hold on to it. And within the hour, right, because we parted ways right after, I had to get back in touch with that friend. And I had to tell him, hey, I wasn't just a liar 10 years ago. I'm still a liar because I lied to you just an hour ago. Please forgive me. <coughs> and he laughed at me and he said, that's okay, Batman. You're a great guy. I don't know why you call me Batman, but that's what he said. <laughs> and he forgave me, right? And I was walking in the light. The truth was setting me free because I was walking into the truth and there was new stuff going on in my heart. I'm not held captive by the sin of lying anymore. So I, I guess if I lie to you, you can expect a phone call later. Um, God is making an amazing promise here. Jesus is making an amazing promise here. He's saying he's the light, he's salvation, he's God, and that when you see him lifted up, right, you need to believe that he is. He is God. He is dying for you and for your sins. And if you walk in the light, if you are true, if you confess your sins, if you're willing to come into the light and not hide in darkness, the blood of Jesus will cleanse you from all sins. Yes. Jesus replied, Very truly I say to you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. But now a slave, verse 35, has no permanent place in the family. But a son has a permanent place. He's a member of the family. He belongs to it forever. Verse 36, so if, you, if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. You really will be. Jesus can make this call. He can really say the truth will set you free. He can really say, I will set you free from your sins. I know that you are Abraham's descendants. Yet you are looking for a way to kill me because you have no room for my word. I am telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence and you are doing what you have heard from your father. Ooh, who's their father? Not Abraham, apparently. Of course, they don't really know who Jesus' father is yet either. There's a lot of confusion going on. It's about to all get really clear and really tense. Okay. The Jews say, Abraham is our father. Jesus doesn't buy it. If you were children of Abraham, you'd, you'd be like Abraham. Hmm? Verse 39, if you were Abraham's children, Jesus said, then you would do what Abraham did. Right? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Jesus is God. They don't believe him because they don't believe the truth and they don't know God. Mm. If you were Abraham's children, then you would do what Abraham did. As it is, you are looking for a way to kill me. A man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham didn't do th such things. You are doing the works of your own father. We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. In the Greek, they highly emphasize the word we there. To say, we're not the ones who are illegitimate children. You, Jesus. Right? A lot of people think that they're commenting on his virgin birth. Uh, could be. Could just be an offensive thing to say, right? We have offensive, similarly offensive words in English. I won't repeat them here, right? But to, to call someone an illegitimate child, I don't know. But they're, they're trying to be offensive now. They're getting darker as the light shines. Mm. Right. The Jews say, the only father we have is God himself. So much for Abraham being your father, I guess. Yeah. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I have come here from God. Now, hold on. Earlier he said he came here from the Father. Right. Ah, who's his Father? God. God. Starting to make it a little more clear. Who did he say they didn't know? God, his Father. <laughs> I have not come on my own. God sent me. Hmm. I have not come on my own. God sent me. 
Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, Diabolos, the slanderer. And you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. He's saying, Satan is your father. You are walking in darkness. Mm. Lying is your native language. Mm. You guys are murderers like him from the beginning. You are exemplifying who's your father, who's ruling your lives, because you guys are still slaves to sin and need to be set free. They need to come into the light. Verse 45. Yet because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? I am telling the truth. Why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is you do not belong to God. You are not God's people. The Jews answered him, Are we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon-possessed? Right? They come back with a racial slur and calling him a demoniac. Hmm. Aren't we right in saying you're a Samaritan and, and demon-possessed? Jesus doesn't deal with the Samaritan thing. He just says, I'm not possessed by a demon. Right? He's not the one who's a child of Satan. But I honor my father, and you dishonor me. I am not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. So the judge is the one who seeks to honor the son. The judge is God. The judge is the father. So what do you think the judge will have to say to those who seek to dishonor Jesus? You'll notice the Jews are getting more intense. <laughs> They're getting more upset as Jesus continues to tell the truth. And you'll notice this about light, is that light and darkness cannot dwell together, right? right? There can either be darkness or light, but they cannot hang out in the same space. Jesus goes on to say, verse 51, Very truly I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. What? At this they exclaimed, Now we know you are demon-possessed. Abraham died, and so did the prophets. Yet you say whoever obeys your word will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died, and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Mm. Well, that's who he's been saying from the beginning, right? <laughs> he's the light of the world, right? And notice, as the darkness increases around Jesus, he just shines brighter. Yes, yes. Beginning, he's speaking almost in a veiled sort of speech, right? but it's becoming more and more clear. You don't know the Father. You will die in your sins, right? Because when he is the light, he has to reveal their sins. He has to say, you will die in your sins. He has to say, you are slaves to sin, but he also shines brighter in this way. He says, but I can set you free from that sin. He says, if you walk into the light, right? Yes. There will be truth. There will be confession. Your sin will be exposed. But if you walk in the light, what did he just say? There's eternal life. Mm -hmm. He promises eternal life. It's getting more and more intense. He's showing the light. He's showing who he is. Jesus said, right, you'll surely die in your sins if you do not believe that I am. It'll be clear who I am when I am lifted up, when I have died for your sins, right? Mm. Look to Christ. He's come to you. Yes. He has died for you to set you free. You must believe in him, who he says he is, that he is God, that he is the one who can settle the debt. He is the one who can forgive sins. Put your faith in him, walk into the light, and you'll be free and you'll have eternal life. Jesus replied to the Jews in verse 54, right? The Jews said, who do you think you are? He says, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My father, whom you claim is your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, 
I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I obey his word. Hmm. Jesus says, you do not know God. If you knew the Father, you would know me. If you knew God, you would know me. But you don't know me, and you don't know God, and you won't listen to his voice. If they need salvation, they need to look to God. And here he is to bring it to them. Verse 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was very glad. And the Jews at this time believed that Abraham was given a vision of the Messiah, right? And was able to see that, whether that's true or not. I don't know. It's just tradition. You can maybe try and find it in the Old Testament somewhere. But the Jews almost certainly understood this as Jesus saying, I'm the Messiah. Right? The Jews don't take kindly to that. <laughs> you are not yet 50 years old, they said to him. And you have seen Abraham? <laughs> Jesus says, Amen, amen. That's what it says in the Greek. A lot of translations says, verily, verily, very truly. But it's that word, amen. Amen, amen, I say to you. Right? Amen, it means very truly. But here he's declaring divine authority over what he's about to say in advance. He's saying this is divinely true. It's divinely <laughs> right. Amen, amen, I say to you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. Oops. <laughs> he says, I am. And before Abraham was born, okay, we're expecting a past tense verb. Does he say, I was? No, even though the New World Translation does. He says, I am. There's no way you could possibly translate this in the past tense. It doesn't work in the Greek. I've read the, the Jehovah's Witness explanation, their arguments for how they try and get there from the Greek. It's bonkers and ludicrous. They make up things and just use random grammar phrases to try and pull it together. He says, I am. I am Yahweh, right? That's who I am, and I can set you free. I'm the Son, and I can set you free indeed. I am the truth who can set you free. I'm here to offer you eternal life, but you will die in your sins. You will look for me. You will look for salvation, but you won't find me because you have to find Jesus as he says he is, the God who can die for you and pay for your sins. He's the light of the world. And who else is the light of the world? Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, you, my people, yes. are the light of the world. <laughs> yes, the city on the hill cannot be hidden. Why did I go ahead and read all the way to verse 58 so far? That was a long passage for this morning, and I'm, probably my sermon's too long. Who knows? <laughs> right? Why did I do that? Because I want you to see what it looks like for Jesus to be the light of the world and shine in darkness. I don't want to just summarize it and tell you what light means. I want you to see what it looks like, because guess what? That's your job too. When Jesus says, you are the light of the world, the city on a hill cannot be hidden, what's he calling you to do? He's calling you to say stuff like this. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to say to people, you will indeed die in your sin if you do not put your faith in Jesus Christ. You will indeed die in your sin if you don't come clean, if you don't step into the light. Right. Those are things we've been called to tell to people. But you can be free. You can be free from your sin. Can you believe that? Mm -hmm. And not only that, you can say, as things get darker and darker, there's the promise of eternal life in Jesus Christ. Amen. You can walk into the light and be free. And we're called to say that. And I want you to see that in your own life, if you walk in the light as he is in the light, right, the blood of Jesus will cleanse you from all sins. And if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us all unrighteousness. Jesus is going to be that light source in you. You have no light apart from him. Light and dark can't exist in the same place. So when his light comes, you've got very few options. <laughs> you can hide yourself. You can try and shield yourself. I'm not listening. You can try to get Jesus to shut up, or you can try to get Christians to shut up. Oh, don't share that, please. That makes me uncomfortable. You can have your faith, but don't share it with me. You can try and snuff out the light. You can try and kill it. Remember we read in John chapter 1, the darkness has not overcome it. Or you can step into the light. Have your sin be revealed. You can confess and know that he is faithful and just. Now he is a source of light in you as you bear that testimony to others. Mm -hmm. And I, I do want you to see, right? That's why I've read this far so far. 
is that when Jesus is the light of the world, as things get darker, he shines brighter and brighter. But when he is the light of the world, it does, in fact, end with everybody pulling out their guns and pointing them straight at Jesus' head. Look at what happens. At this, they picked up stones to stone him. These aren't rocks and pebbles to bother him. These are rocks to crush in Jesus' skull, to maim and disfigure him and destroy him till there is nothing left of him. Their goal is to snuff out that light. That's a lot of the time what will happen when we are the light of the world. Darkness will not abide by it. They won't like it. They have very few options. Somehow Jesus hid himself slipping away from the temple grounds. Who knows? Because <laughs> why? We read it earlier, his time had not yet come. And he lays down his life of his own accord. No one takes it from him. That happens a lot. And it just is always laughable to me. Jesus just slips away. One of my absolute favorites. This is a little off topic, but in Luke, there's this time where everybody's like, yeah, we got to kill him. They're running after him, chasing him to throw him off a cliff. They're running him towards the cliff and he's just gone. You almost kind of imagine some of them falling off the cliff. <laughs> a little lighthearted humor, but we'll get back to it. Are there people in your life? This is convicting, right? It's convicting to me too. Are there people in your life who are in darkness and somehow you've been able to abide with them? Is that because you have dimmed the brightness of the light? How can light and dark abide together? But also, how can you be light at all? Because this is scary and hard. If you're the light of the world, if you're going forward and you're saying the types of things that Jesus has said here, indeed you are liars. You will die in your sin if you don't believe this, if you don't come to cross, if you don't come to Christ, if you don't believe he is God, if you don't surrender to him, if you don't walk in the light, you will die in your sins. That is hard, that's scary. And if you say it, people won't like you. People will hate you. People might even try to kill you. It's hard to imagine in our culture, but it's definitely possible. How are you going to do that? That is really hard. How is Jesus able to do that? Well, he said it a lot at the beginning. He said, I know where I come from. I know who I am. He said, I know about the Father, and I am with the Father. Jesus was able to see and do what he did because he was rooted in the Father's love. He was rooted in his identity as the Son of the Father. He was rooted in the glory he receives from the Father. So what about you? Can you be rooted in God's love? Do you know how much the Father loves the Son? Obviously, the answer is no. It is too immense for us to imagine, right? This is my beloved son, right? They've been eternally together. The father loves the son. And how deep the father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he would give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. Jesus was the son. He was the beloved son with whom he was well pleased. That was Jesus' identity. But what is Jesus saying on the cross for you and for me? He's saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's not saying, I'm basking in the Father's love. He's not dealing with that. He's dealing with the wrath of God that you and I deserve so that you could bask in the love of God, so that you could be called a son of God and by the spirit of adoption cry out, Abba, Father, you're a son, you're a daughter, you are a child of God. And God loves you, and not because of anything you've done, but because he is faithful and just to forgive. If you confess your sins, if you walk into the light, you come to the light of the world, he is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the truth that will set you free. And you can bask in the Father's love. You can bask in the identity as a child of God. You can bask in the glory. Right? This is my, my son with whom I am well pleased. And if you're a Christian, 1 Corinthians 5 tells us, he who knew no sin became a curse for us that we might become the righteousness of God. Right? Not only are you clean of your sins, but Jesus has given you righteousness. God is well pleased with you. He can rejoice over you with singing. Zephaniah 3.17. He can, 
He can glory in you and take delight in you. So when you're called to be the light of the world, it's still going to be scary and hard. But you can be rooted in God's love. He loves you deeply. Not because of anything you've done, but because Jesus bore the wrath. You don't have to be worried about people hating you. You don't have to worry about who you are and being a weirdo because you're a child of God, if that's your identity. And you don't have to worry about the shame you might endure when you're rejected by society because the Father gives you Christ's glory and credit for his righteousness and the things that he has done. And so there's challenge. Shining a light in the darkness is hard. I was talking to Ashley about it last night because we were pretty confident that our kids were going to be too sick to come to church today. She was like, what are you going to preach on? And she was just like, man, when, when we were in Japan, we were in darkness all the time. And it was so, so hard to be the light. To be 100% honest with you, there were days where we failed. Like, there's probably opportunities to share the gospel. We missed them because it was so hard to keep doing it each day. But she's like, but there was a different sort of joy there, wasn't there? to be the light in the darkness. And I don't want you to come away saying, ah, I see. I'm called to say things that will get me stoned. Because you are. But there's an indescribable joy in it too. That makes Ashley and I say, man, we really hope Japan opens back up because we do want to endure that, that joy. Right? We do want to just go. We do want to go back. It's going to be hard. And Satan desires to sift us like wheat or something. right? It's just hard. But there's an incredible joy in knowing that you've been set free, that you're cleansed of all sin, of all unrighteousness, that you are the Father's, that you are his child, and you are saved. Jesus is the light of the world, not just the light of Jerusalem. He's called you to be the light of the whole world. He's declared himself to be the light of the whole world. And so there is also a command that we take it to the nations, right? We do need to take it to the entire planet, and it is hard, but it's where we've been called. We're going to pray. Heavenly Father, you are the light of the world, and that is not an easy thing to believe, and it's a harder thing still to emulate, and we can't do it unless you're our source of light. We can't do it unless you're our source of identity, Lord. And we know that it's only as much as we believe that we're your children that we'll be able to go forward and endure sometimes hate and distaste and disgust at your message, Lord, because those who do not know you, Lord, hate you. We pray and ask that your light would shine to the entire world. We pray that it would boldly shine in our own lives. Lord, oftentimes as we proclaim your light, that means we are continually coming clean. We're confessing our own sin, right? Because we can't hide any of it. That's to stay in darkness. God, we know that we are sinful. We've come here to worship you this morning. We confess we've lied, we've stolen, we've cheated, we've dishonored your name. Lord, and we pray not on account of what we have said or what we have done, but in the name of you. Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, your only son who died in our place. We ask for grace, Lord, that we could truly be cleansed of all sins and know it and then preach your gospel boldly. I pray as we take communion soon, Lord, we can just come back and remember what is so true, that salvation is not dependent on us. Lord, and I pray also that we can remember that we do this together. We're not alone. We don't need to be in a huddled little ball between you and us, right, taking communion, Lord, but we can rejoice knowing that we're all sinners who desperately need the bread and the wine, who desperately need to be saved by the blood that has been poured out to cleanse the sins of many. We're dependent on you. We trust in you. We look to you. We worship you. We honor you because you are God. It's in your name we pray. Amen.